called Negro. Um, those are those are God's chosen people, and I can show you that, but maybe later. But that's what he's talking about, and that's what the word was given to. See, that's the one thing um, that we were given to make us special, if you will, the word that was given. And we were supposed to be a kingdom of priests and holy nation, and we went against that. And one of the things, if you read in Deuteronomy 28, it tells us that one of the things that would happen if we were to go against that is that we would go into captivity. It even describes being taken into slave ships and being sold as bond men and bond women. So when we got here, after in, being in a diaspora and dwelling amongst the African nations, we were the ones that were sold. And what happened was when we were sold here, the Bible talks about God's wooden stone. We got a faith system that had been adulterated by Europeans, and that has been used to further enslave us. See, the Bible, the word of God, the Bible, Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. One thing about this, the word of God in its true form and its true essence can make you free. Even spiritually, it can make you free. But it also can be used inappropriately, or inappropriately similar to how the brother was describing to get into your pocketbook. It can be used to further enslave you. That's why they used it in slavery. Uh, for example, I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, Thurman, who was Martin Luther King's, one of his mentors. He talked about how in Jesus and then disinherited how his grandmother, who was a slave, wouldn't read Paul's epistles. And he asked, why, why won't you read them? And he said, because, she said, because the slave master used these to further enslave us. They were misused. And that's how the Bible is today. It's misused in a lot of different ways. But when you truly look at it, it's freedom there. It's freedom there. So we want to start off really, uh, in the, what I'm going to deal with today is the title is, Do We Make Boy the Law? God forbid. Um, and when I say law, I'm talking about what was given in the days of Moses, the Torah or the instruction of God. Do we make the law void because we have grace? We have this unmerited, undeserved uh, favor from God because of sin. So let's start off in Psalms, the 19th division, or the 19th chapter. Psalms 19. I love to start, <laughs> to start here because regardless of where you're at in your walk, regardless of your ethnic, ethnicity, there's been this universal revelation that there is a creator. And the universal revelation has been shown through the creation. So here in Psalms 19 and 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So if you're ever wondering, does God exist, the sun and the moon and the stars, the, the heavens show us that he does exist. It says, Day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night, Show of knowledge. There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Regardless of whatever language you speak, you speak in Swahili, you speak in Ebonics, whatever it is, you know that there is a God. Because the heavens are telling you so. And you can be that age and smaller and realize there's something bigger than mama and daddy. Verse 4 reads, Their line is going out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world, wherever you at on the planet. And then hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices at a strong man to run a race. What the heathen or the pagans have done, my brother mentioned paganism, one thing that they have done, they have worshipped the creation. They worship the sun as opposed to the one who put the sun out there. His going forth from the end of the heaven and his circuit, or the orbit of the sun, unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. It can get cold. It can even be dark, but at a certain point, that sun is going to touch that spot on the earth. So that's, that's showing you that there's a God, but then it goes on directly after that, which should be the natural progression to each and every human being when you realize there is a God, is you should ask the question, what does God require of me? Similar to how the brother said he was seeking. So you got to find out what this God requires of you. And immediately, the psalmist David, he goes right into Torah. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. 
See, one thing the law does is it shows us how to live. You come here, <laughs> you come here covered in blood, born between your the feces, as Cornel West would say, and you're born into a situation, not knowing. But as soon as you come into a little bit more consciousness and can conceptualize things, you understand, wait a minute, there's something greater than myself. There's a being in which I must bring my body into subjection to and my will into subjection to. How do I do that? What does he require of me? And he's shown us what he requires through his law or through his Torah, through his instruction. It is a guide to living. Like you said, we weren't eating pork. But why weren't you eating pork? Because he says, don't eat swine. It's really that simple. And when you really look at it, scientifically, you can see the benefits of not eating swine and bottom feeders and so forth. So it says, uh, he says in verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous, all together more to be desired than in gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Then it says something, it said, moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them is great reward. So when you don't know how to live, you have all these problems that are going to come into your life because you're living in the wrong, in the, in the incorrect way. And there's all these built-in consequences for transgressing or breaking God's law. Okay? So now let's go to, uh, let's see. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Romans 1. Let's go to Romans 1. And just so we know what sin is, we know what sin is. Right, okay, so when that's what sin is. Breaking and transgressing, those are synonyms. Right, so that's what, that's what sin is. When you break the law, you have sin. So now here, this is uh, Romans 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 18. Because here Paul the Apostle, in Romans 1, verse 18, he tells of, of this uh, universal revelation of God. See, even though the word or the, the law or the Torah was given to one people, that's why it says, only you have known of all the nations of the earth, therefore I'll punish you for all your iniquities. He says, Romans 3 says, uh, what advantage does have the Jew? What profit is there a circumcision much cheaper in every way? For to them were committed the oracles of God. He hasn't known any people like he knew us in the sense of coming down on the mount, the mount being on fire, and he delivering the law unto a people. That happened to one people. That happened to the Chinese, and that happened to those uh, Romans. Rather, it was the children of Israel that that happened to. But at the same time, there has been a universal uh, revelation of the existence of God. So therefore, mankind still should know that they got to serve this God. This is Romans 1 and verse 18. Because here Paul talks about why the whole world is guilty. He says, the, for the wrath, in Romans 1 and 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So mankind, is, they, they possess a truth, but they hold it unrighteously. What's this truth? Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. What has he shown them? Verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power here and God here, so that they were without excuse. But what was made? In the beginning, the Bible tells you, God created the what? The heaven and the earth. So that's why man is guilty. Because he showed himself unto them through his creation. He says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So man doesn't have excuse to be disobedient. Because if you know there's a God, you know you need to be seeking him and trying to figure out how you used to serve him. And verse 21 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So what man has done, he has rejected the existence of God. And they have really formed their own version of a God. He said, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God 
into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So what man has done, he has made idols. And so in the making of idols, because you can't make a God. That's like the atheists will ask the question, well, who created God? God, or what we call God, was not created. He, he exists outside of the confines that confine us. He's not limited by gravity. He's not limited by time. He's omniscient. And he's omnipotent. But when you create a God out of silver, gold, and wood, and stone, well, now you got to create the attributes for that God. And now you create the standard for that God. And in essence, you creating a God. You read in Isaiah, well, in Jeremiah, he talks about the stock of the tree is vanity. You know, that's what they do. They cut down a tree. They, at one point, they bow down to it as a God. Then the next minute, they cut it up to heat, to heat themselves. To cook on the fire that they create from this God that they create. And that's what man has done, even in Christianity. They have made a God, as Paul said, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Man has put his own standard upon God, and God is a spirit. He's not in that stone, he's not in wood, he's not in gold and silver. So it says in verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So one thing about God, you turn your back on him, he'll turn his back on you. And he will allow you to believe in whatever you want, because we are free agents. He's not making robots. Man makes robots in automation. He, he gives us free will to love him or not. So when man, what man has done is he's created his own God, and the true and living God has separated himself. And when you make a God, when you reject God, now you will do any and everything. It says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. For this, amen, and then it says, for this cause God gave them up, I mean, verse 26, unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So what is he talking about? He's talking about lesbianism. You think about, well, why would that take place? Because if you did reject God, you rejected, quite frankly, a standard of living. You rejected instruction. You re rejected law. And when you do that, you are liable to do anything. Because you don't have a standard by w that will confine you as far as what you won't do. And what you will do oftentimes is based on the vain imagination of the mind. Because it's successful. That's why you got to wash it with the water of the word. So it says, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust one toward another. So what he's describing Right now, it's similar to when you look at the world today is what you see. You see all this illicit sexual behavior, all types of things that are going on. You think, why is that happening? It's happening because there's been a rejection of God. And when you reject God, you reject his standard. So it said, likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet or fitting. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So what have they done? It says being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, Implacable, unmerciful, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is first century, but this is what you see today. The world is full of sin. It's full of wickedness because the world has rejected God and in essence rejected his law. But even before Moses and Mount Sinai, when that, when that event took place, there was always law. There was always law, even in the beginning. Let's turn to the beginning. Let's go to uh, Genesis, the second chapter. There's always been law. Now, this Genesis, the first book of the Bible, this is before the law was officially given in the days of Moses and Aaron. But the law has always been here. Let's go to Genesis 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7. So it says in Genesis 2 and 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Notice he didn't put a soul inside a man. You are the soul. And when you die, you are a dead soul. That's a misconception people have. Like you got a soul inside of you, and when you die, float off. We see that in the movies, but you can't read that in the Bible. You are the soul. All right, so in verse 15, he made this man and in his image and in his likeness. And then when he made, he set the table for man. He made the garden. He made everything. And then immediately he gave him what? Instructions or Torah. It says, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Okay, so he had purpose. But then it said, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What is he telling them? Is he telling them that you can't eat this apple off this tree? He's not talking about an apple at all. This is allegorical. What he's saying is, listen, there's one who I don't want you to commune with, that you can eat of that fruit. See, there's more than one way to eat. We can eat with our, with our, our mouths. We can also eat with our ears and what we listen to. And the one who was given the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that serpent was given, who was Satan, was given particular knowledge. And he was telling them, do not commune with Satan. You could deal with the tree of life, which was him, or you could deal with Satan. And Satan's whole M.O. is to get you to sin against God. That's how he does it. And today he does it through his ministers. That's how he's doing it. As Paul said, these ministers, they look like ministers of righteousness, but they are ministers of Satan. So he gave him instruction immediately. Let's go to, uh, let's, let's turn a little bit. Let's go to uh, Genesis, the third chapter, and the 19th verse. Because when man sinned against God, Eve was deceived, and Adam, the Bible says, he wasn't deceived.